Hey everyone, welcome, thanks. Wow, it's cool to be in the, the corner of Web Summit that actually has um, some developers um, creating code. Uh, I've seen a lot of bankers and a lot of uh, investors and a lot of uh, uh, people, you know, government people that are just interested, but uh, um, we're really we're really building it here. These are the people that are really building it. Does anybody use Stack Overflow in this audience by any chance? All right, wait, no, keep your hands up, hands up, hands up. Okay, one, two, three. All right, let's say 10. Um, this is really awesome, being the people that actually create things. Uh, um, we're, we're, we're creating the world here, and, and everything in the world has a computer in it. Um, there's this expression, software is eating the world, which um, came from Mark Andreessen uh, originally. And I like to think that developers are sort of writing that software. They're writing, and therefore, they're, they're creating the script for everything that will run in the future. At home, I have a toilet seat, a Japanese toilet seat that probably has like 12 cores in it. I'm sure it has more CPU power than the entire Apollo 11 space program had uh, to get uh, people to the moon. So that's pretty amazing. And all that software um, is software that was created by people. Um, does anybody here use salt? I know that's a crazy salt shakers. Anybody, anybody, anybody? Does your salt shaker have Bluetooth? And anybody, no? Nobody has a Bluetooth salt shaker? You guys are like in the Stone Age. It's ridiculous. Um, how do you get music onto your salt shaker? I mean, what are you going to use USB or something like a peasant? Uh, the, the software uh, is everywhere. Um, developers are creating it. Um, and that's uh, what this talk is all about. Um, we're creating uh, the, this layer of, of soup that we're going to live in. And there are really two things I want to talk about. One is how we're creating the future as developers, but also how it wouldn't have really become possible if it wasn't for the high level of abstraction, uh, the abstractions that are, that are made available to us. And that's how I'll get the Stack Overflow in my story at the end. So I want to start with a personal example, which is this is my first computer, the original IBM PC model, whatever, the first one that came out. And uh, an interesting observation here is for many years, computers had an on-off switch. It was a big red switch. It was connected to the power supply. It was in the back. And when you flipped a switch, the electrons that were going to the computer were physically disconnected and unable to continue in their path, right? So you literally cut off power to the computer uh, the minute you flip that switch, which now sounds hilarious and primitive, like what, you just, this computer just lost electricity? Um, nowadays, of course, you have a button on the keyboard, and the button runs code, and the code finds demons and starts to shut them down, and it gracefully shuts down the Wi-Fi, and it cancels your Amazon Prime subscription um, temporarily, and does all kinds of stuff, and then it doesn't really turn your computer off, it puts it in sleep mode, and your computer can continue in sleep mode for hours without running out of juice. Um, the sleep mode is still technically using more electricity than the entire 17th century, for example. Um, or, you know, North Korea. Sorry, that's not nice. Um, but, you know, technically it's asleep. So that's, um, just think about how many lines of code actually run. Again, would have taken six hours to run all this code on the original IBM PC just to get into sleep mode. Uh, and that's um, really uh, one of the biggest um, uh, changes we've had. The changes affect every aspect of our daily life where things that you used to do directly, like flipping a switch, have become software uh, mediated things. So instead of raising your hand and a taxi comes by, you know, have these apps like Uber and you run the little app and you push the little button to summon the car and you see a little animated car moving on the screen, which, you know, goes into rivers and comes out of rivers and goes through buildings. And eventually um, the actual car shows up right where you are. And that's kind of amazing because uh, at no point do you actually have to talk to the driver, which is very nice. Although sometimes they call you and ask if you call the car and, you know, where, where are you going? Where are you? I, that, use the app. There's an app. That's why we made this app. Um, so uh, software is eating the world. And um, as the world changes, instead of interacting directly with one another, um, we're starting to inter interact with the software and then the software interacts with the other people for us. So you might be summoning a car, but... Similarly, some code is running in on servers in eight different countries and causing the driver to be told to go uh, pick you up. Um, think of uh, an Amazon uh, warehouse. This is um, another kind of example 
uh, where you have rows and rows of shelves and nobody knows what's on those shelves. You know, it's like little rubber things that were made in China. Nobody knows what that stuff is, but they walk around and, uh, and everybody has uh, these little computers that are strapped onto their wrist. And the computer tells them exactly where to walk and where to go. And it says, go to shelf 23 and go this way and climb up to whatever and take down a box. And it should be box with this barcode on it and scan the barcode, make sure that put it in a box and, and ship it. So again, because the software is in the middle, now all of a sudden you can do interesting things that you didn't used to be able to do. So at some point, um, some smart developer working at Amazon noticed that whenever something was on the top shelf and you sent a short person to go pick it up, they couldn't reach. And so they would stop and they would have to go find a step ladder and it would take like a whole minute or something for them to pack that thing, which is ridiculous and incredibly inefficient. And so they wrote some code and the code essentially just checked the height of the employee. And if the employee was too short, they were not sent to pick things off of the top shelf. And a fairly simple change to the code made all of their warehouses, you know, 0.0001% more efficient, um, which is either awesome or kind of weird in a way. But I think it's really neat that the minute you get software in between the people, you can start to optimize and you can start to change things. And essentially, um, one way of thinking about this is that you can, you can have an agenda. Uh, you, you can sort of decide how things are going to work. Um, all this software is written by human beings who sit there and get to make these decisions. And then it has an agenda. So well, what kind of agendas are we talking about? Amazon is just trying to make their warehouse more efficient uh, and just trying to figure out a way to pack boxes faster. Um, Uber, again, similarly, is trying to make it as cheap as possible for you to get cars as quickly as possible um, so that they can make as much money as possible. But they have all kinds of little bits and pieces to their agenda. Um, Let's talk about the Facebook agenda for a minute, because that's kind of an interesting one here where the developers at Facebook, I think, did not really know what their agenda um, should have been. So the agenda at Facebook is, uh, you know, I was cynically wrote to make you look at ads, but the real agenda at Facebook is how can we keep you on Facebook? How can we keep you looking at the Facebook feed all the time, keep you coming back on a, on a regular basis? And so the Facebook um, feed is entirely optimized for engagement or for keeping you coming back. Um, it's not optimized for making you happy. Let me tell you a little story. I called a friend up once, um, my best friend, and I said, hey, um, there's a cool party tonight. Do you want to go to the party? He said, oh, I really can't. I'm like super tired. I'm really busy. I have all this stuff to do, and I have open heart surgery tomorrow. Okay, fine. That's a good excuse. You don't have to come with me to the party. So I stayed home by myself. And the next day, I logged onto Facebook and discovered <clears throat> not only had he gone to the party, but Facebook had ratted him out. Uh, what, what is Facebook doing here? Facebook doesn't know. It's like, well, there's a picture of your friend and, I don't know, your ex-wife. You're probably going to be really interested in seeing this picture. And uh, I, I guess I, I was, but now I knew that my best friend was not really my best friend. In fact, he probably didn't really like hanging out with me at all. And so now I'm going to be sad for three months. Um, stay home and use Facebook a lot, I guess. So Facebook is, uh, again, not optimizing for anything, really, other than keeping you coming back to Facebook. So I solved that problem. Um, and, and nevertheless, the outcomes that, that are occurring because of what Facebook is doing um, are not really optimal. There was, um, there was a sort of scientific research that was done by Facebook in which uh, they actually manipulated the feeds of hundreds of thousands of people in order to do the research. And they discovered that showing people happy things makes them happy and showing people sad things makes them sad or something like that. And it's not really the most shocking result. I think any child could have told you that. Um, but they're academics, so they called it emotional contagion because that sounded cool. Uh, and they had discovered it in this experiment. And I th what I thought was interesting about this is a million people got angry and wrote all these blog posts and editorials saying it is completely unethical of Facebook to manipulate our emotions for the purpose of an academic study. Which I think is funny <laughs> because 99%, what do you think Facebook is doing all day long? What do you think they do all the time? They manipulate everybody for the purpose of just getting you to keep coming back to Facebook and nothing else. Uh, so that surely that should be um, the, the controversy here. And one of the things I think that we're seeing with Facebook is that, that just optimizing for that one thing 
um, it's not leading to the right thing. You know, when the social networks first came out, um, you, you know, there was all this talk about how it was going to lead to democratization and there was going to be, um, you know, Twitter revolutions and people would be able to, you know, organize resistance against uh, tyrants of the world. Um, and uh, that was all going to be um, like ultra super amazing. But um, what I think uh, really happened is uh, the same thing that happened with television. When television first came out, we were told that television was going to be this amazing way of educating the entire world. You could bring university lectures from Harvard to every you know peasant in Bangladesh, and it would be fantastic. And everybody could learn, you know, molecular biochemistry or something from the, from the television. And obviously what television really brought us is the Kardashians and Donald Trump. And I think social media has also brought us uh, something um, quite similar. Another um, kind of accidental effect of what happened with social media uh, is I think everybody by now is aware of the fact that their feeds are only showing them political things that they agree with. Uh, and that we have divided the world up into extreme right and extreme left, and uh, and, and people are being sort of fed things uh, that support their own worldview, um, whether they're factual or not, whether it's real news or fake news. And we used to have a name for this that before it was done by companies. When it was done by governments, we called it propaganda, and it was considered to be this horrible, terrifying thing. And people wrote books about um, about being manipulated by only being shown, you know, certain parts of the real story or not even being told uh, the truth at all. Um, but now it's just kind of happening quietly by these algorithms. These algorithms sort of decide, hey, you want to see something. It's weird. Uh, when I say the algorithm decides, uh, that's kind of another funny thing to say, because it's not even an algorithm deciding, right? It's just some matrix multiplication. It's some machine learning. It's looking at just a massive, massive numbers of, of, of floating point numbers and multiplying them. And, uh, and essentially, uh, then something pops up in your feed because it's 0.3% statistically more likely um, to get you in, uh, engaged. Um, engagement, of course, comes from righteous indignation. Righteous indignation uh, is that sense of you know, anger or self-righteousness or smugness or whatever that is actually probably the, the sauce that feeds most people's behaviors on feeds and keeps them coming back and keeps them motivated more than almost anything else. And unfortunately, this is uh, how uh, we get the election results uh, that we've been getting Lately, the truth is not really relevant to the algorithms. They have no attempt to discern whether or not they're giving you real news or fake news. Um, There's an expression that I'm going to make up right now. I just made it up uh, that a lie gets halfway around the world before the truth has a chance to get its pants on. And indeed, um, the, the lies sort of um, spread very, very quickly. And then the corrections uh, don't follow at all. So anyway, software is eating the world uh, for, for good or for bad, and it's affecting everything from how you order a, a, a car, uh, a taxi, to how you uh, to who gets elected. And the people who write that software are developers. And the developers, if you make them, are, are I think super important because when you make a mistake, the mistake can have sort of enormous impacts on human beings. And if you think of your software as just being and I got to create some functionality that my boss has asked for, but you don't really think about what the impact will be on society of those decisions, uh, then uh, you get some sort of accidental results. So let me drill down a little bit more about on what it's like to write software, and you're all developers, so you've seen code before, and this is a really awesome algorithm in Python. This uses the entire internet to check your text for spelling errors. It's pretty cool, one page of Python code. But... Um, that's Python uh, code for you, and, and, and code consists of individual lines of code. An individual line of code consists of, what is it? There's an if statement, there's a function call, there's some parameters. Every one of those things is a decision that was made by a developer. That is the script of the future, and those decisions are tiny. Uh, if you call one function four arguments, that's five decisions you just made. What, were the, what are the arguments going to be? And those decisions are tiny. But, you know, we're all collectively making them like little grains of sand, and we're building the future out of those decisions. So pay attention um, to what they are. They're really important. Um, and that's what I mean by developers writing the script for the future. Now, writing code, as it turns out, is pretty hard. Does anybody, let's do, I want to do a poll. Let's see what you think. Do you think that writing code is getting easier or getting harder? Those of you who think it's getting easier, raise your hand. Getting easier. I'm going to go with about an eight, uh, getting harder. That was a little bit more. It's about a third, two thirds, I think. Um, 
in some ways it's getting easier, in some ways it's getting harder. It's getting harder because you're doing amazing things. It's getting easier because these abstraction layers have been um, uh, have been created for it for us, uh, and the abstraction layers let us do things that we didn't used to understand at all. Just to put things in uh, like a 20 year perspective, this is the world's most popular application in 19. Uh, I'm going to go with 1979, 1980 or so. Um, this is VisiCalc. And VisiCalc uh, is the original spreadsheet program that caused every person in business to run out and buy an Apple II computer, which is the first time PCs were ever taken seriously and made Apple into the multi trillion dollar company it is today. And when you look at the app, when you look at VisiCalc, if I told you what it did and said, how long would it take you to code that? You'd be like, this is like a, like a, sophomores, second year students, uh, semester project. Um, it's not that hard. If you had a real programming language that you could actually do this in. Remember, this is running, by the way, this is running on an Apple II computer. The Apple II computer had a little 8-bit CPU. That 8-bit CPU had addition and subtraction, did not have multiplication, did not have division, certainly did not have floating point. Um, although I'm pretty sure that this isn't real floating point. Uh, I, I gather this is just multiplying numbers by a 1,000. Um, but anyway, uh, all that stuff, you had to code it, and you had to code it in assembler. And so um, creating uh, VisiCalc was a, a sort of a monumental achievement. At the time, if you wanted to learn everything there was to learn about programming the computer that I learned to program on, um, which was a, like a PDP-10 or something like that, you got two books. You got KNR, the C programming language, 200 pages. And you could buy the Unix programming book, which you didn't even need. Um, and that told you really kind of everything about the operating system as well. And that was another 200 pages. You were done. There was nothing left to learn about that programming environment after you had um, read these things. Um, but today, obviously, uh, we're in a world that is uh, sort of a zillion times more complicated. And the, the programming languages that were simple and easy, like C, are fading uh, from, from existence. And now everybody's using Node. There's like a million node modules, and you have to learn about NPM and 8,000 different frameworks, and there's a lot of stuff to learn. But this stuff is kind of powerful when you kind of add it all up. It lets you, uh, the sort of the new, the new code, that one in uh, orange is um, Stripe, for example. So Stripe is interesting because it lets you accept payments with about, you know, three characters of code or something like that. It's a very, very easy way to create an entire e-commerce system. So you combine... Uh, Apps like, uh, you combine these APIs, right? So what are these APIs? They're doing sort of incredible things today. You have APIs that display maps. You have APIs that accept payments. You have the Uber API will summon a vehicle which will arrive at your door. Like a human being driving a car will arrive when you call, if you use this API correctly. Um, and that's all pretty cool. And that's stuff that you can do in about an afternoon. To like Even to integrate these three APIs would be, um, you know, an hour of work at a hackathon somewhere. And that's really neat because an hour of work, you used to get like maybe multiplication. This is the code to multiply two 8-bit numbers on an Apple computer and uh, in assembler. And that's not really very useful, just multiplying two 8-bit numbers. So what, probably the multiplication code in, in uh, VisiCalc thought that was a lot longer. So here we are working at this much, much higher level of abstraction. But at this high level of abstraction, what happens is that it seems like it's easy to do stuff. But then stuff surprisingly goes wrong. And then you spend the rest of your life debugging that thing that has surprisingly gone wrong. So I like to ask people, can you imagine if the designers of CSS had invented the user interface to a vehicle? What would happen is you would, you know, you'd be turning left and the car would go left. And you turn right and the car would go right. But if you tried to go straight, the car would disappear. Because, you know... CSS has problems with center and always has center cannot hold, as they say, on stack overflow. Uh, you know, what happens when you hit a bug? I kind of have to explain this to the non-developers. You hit a bug and you're staring at your code and you're saying, I don't know, I, I have this, I'm using Google Maps, I'm embedding the Google Maps in my thingamajiggy. There's a code to embed the Google Maps in the thingamajiggy, but um, unfortunately, the user like hits a little zoom button or they scroll with their finger by mistake and the map zooms in and zooms out. And I do not want to allow them to make the map zoom in and zoom out. How do I fix this? And so most people just look at this code, which they copied and pasted from Stack Overflow, of course, and they see a thing called scale control and they say, yes, I do not want the user to be able to scale. And so they set, to, they set that to false and then they think, okay, I fixed my problem, but they haven't because you can still zoom in 
and zoom out. So what are you going to do now? I mean, you could go buy, there's a book you could buy. It's 450 pages. You have to wait for it to arrive from Amazon because we don't have bookstores anymore. And then you got to read the whole book. And hopefully by then, something will have told you. Obviously, that's not what you do. You go to Stack Overflow. I hope that's Stack Overflow. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and you discover that a million people have already had this exact same problem before, so you can all help each other. Why are you having this problem? You're having this problem because you're using this amazing abstraction that's supposedly making programming easier. But instead of making programming easier, what it means is that you're kind of treading around without really understanding anything about what you're doing, um, which is fine. That's the power. That's where you get the power. You just don't really know how it works yet. And so you have to ask on Stack Overflow, and hopefully um, somebody has answered your question and there's a great answer out there. And um, and and uh, essentially, that's kind of the story of Stack Overflow, and that's why we got billions of answers and billions of questions and billions of people um, having been helped on Stack Overflow over the years. And of course, if you write a good answer, you get the little check mark. The little check mark. Oh, there you go. Somebody has edited my slides. Interesting. Okay, and the check mark leads to reputation. You use your own reputation in the system. Um, in a, in about an hour, you're going to be hearing from John Skeet, who has almost a million reputation, which is insane, um, from simply answering questions and helping uh, literally uh, tens of millions of people um, uh, and influencing sort of their ability to get things done um, and making their lives better through Stack Overflow. So I have about a minute left, and I want to tell you what we're working on now at Stack Overflow. It's the next question everybody raises their hands and says, what's coming up for Stack Overflow? One of the things that we're kind of obsessed with is the idea of private questions. And a private question is something you can't ask the entire world for some reason. Maybe it contains proprietary code, or maybe it's just not relevant to the entire world. It's only relevant to your organization or your company or your school or your class. And so um, we're trying to build systems so that people can ask private questions on Stack Overflow. We have a very early version of this, which is called Stack Overflow Enterprise. So large corporations buy it, they install it, companies like Microsoft have it all set up. And then if you're an employee of Microsoft, there's a Microsoft Stack Overflow where you can ask questions about the Microsoft experience to other Microsoft developers. And um, and we're working on a thing. Let's see if that's even, uh, I don't know what this next slide is. Let's see. Uh, we're working on a thing called uh, Channels. And Channels will be coming soon to stackoverflow.com. And that'll allow anybody to set up a private space on Stack Overflow where they and anybody they invite or anybody in their organization uh, can um, come to ask questions and get answers. And I think that that'll really make a big difference because um, I believe that Stack Overflow um, is really useful, but it's only answering about half of your questions. It's answering the half of your questions that apply to all developers, but the other half are specific to your own situation or your own code base or your own libraries that you use internally, proprietary libraries, and so forth. So essentially, that's, um, that's a little bit of the story of being a developer today, uh, and I hope it will uh, be a good um, kickoff for the full stack uh, summit part of Web Summit. Um, developers are writing the script of the future. It's important. It's really important that you consider kind of your ethical responsibility and think about how the decisions that you make are going to change the world and are going to change society. Um, thank you very much.